I was laying on the surgical table right after delivering our fifth child, who was our fourth son, and the thought hit me, God is answering my prayer. On our first date, Scott and I got into a conversation about the dearth of godly men. And we both felt it so deeply that he said, we need to just stop right now and pray about this. And so we did, in the middle of our first date. And as I lay on that table, I thought, God, you are answering that prayer, but this is a really slow way. <laughs> How do we raise up godly men? Well, we give birth to them. And then we teach them. How do we raise godly men and women in a sex-saturated culture in a way that they know the power of purity? And I don't know if you've noticed some of the reports, but in this sex-obsessed society, there are young men and women choosing sterilization to be certain that they will divorce the sex they desire from the babies that might come. How do we guide our teens into a better way? There is a better way. And I, I don't know, again, exactly what your, uh, the pressure that you feel, but I think parents and godparents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and even older siblings are just sidelined in so many circumstances as if we have nothing to say. And I want to tell you, God has given you something to say. So how do we anticipate delight rather than disaster with our teens? I visited a friend who had just had her baby three weeks earlier. And she was whole, I was actually holding him, little Michael. Um, and all of a sudden, I noticed she was crying. And I said, why are you crying? And she said, I only have 13 years until he's a teen. I didn't even know how to console her. <laughs> she had lived life as a pretty wild teenager, did not know the Lord, and she already anticipated that her son was going to live the same way. I didn't share her fears. My mom had planted the seed in my heart early that the teen years are the best years. And we love our children at every stage of life. The teen years are no less significant we can encourage them to the hilt and believe the best. Before we talk about purity, I just want to go over a few ideas about how we can build and strengthen our relationship with our teenagers. You are essential to the well-being of your teens. We need to fill their emotional reservoirs, letting them know they are wonderful people we enjoy knowing that many of the people are going to deplete those emotional reserves, some of their teachers or teammates, coaches, fellow students, and at times, friends or siblings. We pray for balance between loving our children unconditionally and wanting to fix them, wanting to fix them. That's how God loves us. He loves us so much, but too much to let us just be the way we are. He wants to love us into change. And sometimes, even though they're just as big as the adults around us, we can forget they still need affection. They still need affirmation. They need to feel our pleasure in them rather than a critical spirit toward them. We need to keep building family culture, creating memories, whether or not the teenager seems interested in joining in. Just require it. We work together, play together, worship together, sing together and we draw them back into family life while still giving them the freedom to be with their friends. Strong family identity helps them maintain their bearings during times of turbulence that can knock them off balance. There are times that we can feel disconnected from a child. One mother spoke to me in past years and she said, I feel like I'm going through labor again. It can be very challenging but we bring these concerns before the Lord in prayer and we ask him for wisdom. We lead with trust rather than distrust. And if trust has been broken, we look for the ways to rebuild that trust. We try to anticipate their needs so they'll know we're taking their needs seriously 
and that often takes care of some of the arguments that, that you might have. We link rewards with responsibilities, privileges with productivity, money with good management, and a loss of these rewards for punishments. And we pray for creative ways to express our love. Our ministry of, of presence can be more important with our teenagers than when they were very little. Talking to them when they come home from school, absorbing some of the negativity of the day, talking about the important things that they want to talk about. You know, their world becomes so big in the teen years, and they have ideas about theology and God and politics, and being able to care for them when they're ill, even though they're big, they still are small. I'm not sure why, but teens like to talk at night. And that can be a real challenge when you're doing the great stretch. When I had my last baby, my oldest was 16. He actually drove the two oldest to the hospital to meet their little brother. That was a little bizarre. <laughs> and for me to hold the baby and watch two over six foot tall sons walk in the room was amazing. <laughs> and I remember being up throughout the night with my baby, up early in the morning with my young child who was four, and at night my teens wanted to talk. I remember begging, please, my baby's going to be up in 30 minutes. I have to go to bed. <laughs> and I would say, God, do you think I'm young enough to do this? Apparently he did. And not wanting to miss those conversations with our teens, I tried to, to grab naps to make up for the gaps in my sleeplessness. Adolescents crave respect and dignity, but they still need to be guided with both kindness and firm discipline. Our desire for them to grow in emotional health and moral maturity includes talking about their flaws, faults, weaknesses, sins, but we do it with kindness. And you can jot these proverbs up and look at these and, and ask the Lord, how, how do I need to help in my relationship with my teenager? If we're not careful, we can break their spirit, Proverbs 18, 14. We can even produce a broken heart in Proverbs 18, 8. And we could have a broken relationship, Proverbs 16, 28 and 17, 9. We will have conflict, but we can have healthy resolution of those conflicts. And, you know, junior hires like to argue. So if you teach them apologetics, they'll argue for the faith instead of arguing against it. You know, stumbling blocks can be stepping stones. And our teens also have to adjust to our sins and weaknesses and foibles. And hopefully we'll have the humility to ask for forgiveness. Now, how can we help our teens know the power of purity? Well, it begins with purity of the heart, right? For us and for our teenagers. Purity of heart is the upright, undivided love for God and others, according to the Catechism. In 2 Timothy 2.22, it says, quote, so shun youthful passions and aim at righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call upon the name of the Lord with a pure heart, end quote. We need to challenge our teens and let our teens challenge us in going deeper in our relationship with the Lord. We need purity of mind for ourselves and our teens. Dwelling on pure thoughts is one of those ways we can pursue purity of mind. Philippians 4.8 says this, quote, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, end quote. There's a difference between temptations, which we cannot control, and lingering on those temptations, which we can. We are not passive victims of sin. We're either willing cooperators or courageous resistors by the grace of God. When my little boys were the littlest, uh, I was praying about how I would communicate purity down the road. They were just, I think, uh, four and two at the time. 
And the passage I came across was Psalm 119, 9 and 11. And it says, how shall a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to thy word. Thy word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Memorizing scripture alongside your, teen, your teens, even younger, but definitely by the teen years, will help them put God's word in their heart and strengthen their resolve to pursue purity. We need transformed thinking. We don't even realize all the messages we are inundated with from our culture, even just down to commercials. And, and the passage that I have taken as my life verse is Romans 12, 1 and 2. Verse 2 is this. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable to, and perfect, end quote. This isn't just true for us as adults. This is every bit as true for our children. And so how do we have transformed thinking? We've got to have renewal of our minds. We've got to talk about what does it mean to be a man or a woman? What is the act of marriage? And why is it only for marriage? Did God make a mistake when he made you? Is there a point to being a son or daughter of God that is absolutely connected to being born, created as a boy or girl. And that's how we prove the will of God. And then we pursue purity of our body, that is chastity. You know, chastity is both a gift of grace from the Holy Spirit by virtue of our baptism so that we can imitate Christ's purity as an expression of our purity of heart, but it is also an act of obedience, a faith-filled response. As we develop this virtue through temperance, we apply our reason to our sensual passions and appetites. Our capacity to renounce ourselves and make sacrifices can and must grow. Chastity is a witness to God's faithfulness and love. It's not a negative. It's not a, I can't have sex with anybody, I want to have it. It's positive. I understand the gift of my body, and I want to give my body to God. I want to imitate my Heavenly Father in holiness. St. Jose Maria Escriva gave this quote, and I just love it. By divine vocation, some are called to live this purity in marriage. Others, foregoing all human love, are called to correspond solely and passionately to God's love. Far from being slaves to sensuality, both the married and the unmarried are to be masters of their body and heart in order to give themselves unstintingly to others. The Catechism says, chastity includes an apprenticeship in self-mastery, and this is an ongoing process, right? It has to be developed at every stage in life. It's, it's like developing muscles. There's natural growth to this virtue through many good decisions, and it starts early. We need to help our children understand the difference that they have freedom in Christ, and that doesn't mean license to do whatever they want. Our teens can either govern their passions and find peace in that, or they can let their passions rule and be very unhappy to know you can say no is an important piece of knowledge for our teenagers because our culture is saying, you can't say no, you don't wanna say no, why would you ever say no, right? But we know what real freedom is in Christ. We have to set an example. We need to live marital joy in front of them. One time my daughter came up and said, I have been praying and praying for a sibling and I just wanna know, is it possible? <laughs> and I said, yes, and I don't want you to ask me that again. <laughs> but she just thought, I'm not wasting time on this prayer. If you know, it's really not even an option. One of my friends works 
in a crisis pregnancy center and she was just newly expecting her ninth baby. And she said, I don't understand what I'm seeing. I'm seeing mothers and daughters come in and they get the news that she is pregnant and they are upset, but they're not really upset. And she said, I get the sense that the mother is thinking, well, there'll be a baby in the house again and I don't have to go through a pregnancy and delivery. And the daughter is thinking, there'll be a baby in the house and I won't have to do all the care for the baby. And she said, I'm wondering if teenagers are having babies because their parents won't. And we can communicate with our kids that just as you need water and food and sleep to actually be able to live, you do need love to be able to survive. But you're not going to die without sex. Don't equate sex with love. It's an expression of love. Who has to be chaste? Everyone in their state in life. For the consecrated, they make a complete gift of their bodies to our Lord. For the unmarried people, they refrain from the act of marriage until they actually become married. And for married people, it's being faithful to your one and only, according to the Catechism 2337. We also need not only purity in our bodies, but purity in our interaction with others. And this is just as true of adults as it is for our teens. We need greater self-discipline over our feelings and our imaginations. We are better able to rectify our intentions as we develop those moral virtues that Ted was talking about and that Scott referenced last night. How we speak with discretion and watch sharing too many details about intimacy. The importance of purity in speech and conduct including how we joke, how we dress modestly, refusing to unveil what should remain hidden. The man and woman you marry is the only person that you should see naked or desire. We need the power of the sacraments to be able to live this. You know, Sunday Mass is non-negotiable, obviously, but there is a limited time that you can decide your teenagers will come with you for a daily mass. And I remember many times, even in the Han house, hearing, do we have to go to mass? This is a daily, not a weekly. And I would say, no, we, and they would chime in, get to. <laughs> and you know, we'd go to mass and we'd come back and they were more docile because they'd been with Jesus. You, that's a limited time offer for you to decide that they're gonna go. And then you let God do what God needs to do in their hearts, in their lives. Remember, God is not looking for us to check it off our list. I took care of my Sunday obligation. He wants your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He wants all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, and all of your soul. And he wants the same of your teenagers. So you need to take this to heart before you can then talk about it with your children. Not that you live it perfectly, but you need to go home from this time together and say, you know what, I am going to be more committed to Jesus than ever before by the grace of God, through the power of the sacraments, and I want this for you, sweetheart. Don't hold back, giving your child a challenge to believe. We dance around it. We don't want to offend. We don't know how to say it carefully or whatever. You have earned the right to be heard by being a parent or a grandparent or a godparent or an aunt or an uncle. Confession. Is there any good reason we're not going to confession or taking our children to confession? I remember before I was Catholic, I became convinced confession was a sacrament. And when Scott was acting up one day, I said to him, when was the last time you went to confession? He said, well, I know I can't say that to you now, but someday I will. And then he went and he came back and he was more docile because he met our Lord in the sacrament and the Lord gave him that grace. 
It keeps some kids out of trouble. One of my friends knew every Saturday her father was going to take all 10 of them to confession. And she said, we acted differently on Friday night at parties than a lot of friends, because I didn't want to say all that stuff <laughs> in confession. We have to acknowledge to our children, we still struggle with sin. I mean, St. Paul talks about it in Romans 7. It is critical that we continue to struggle. Their life of prayer and the sacraments will empower them to help form their character and strengthen their resolve. How much as parents do we care for their bodies and how much longer will their souls exist than their bodies? We've got to get the big picture in our minds. Sometimes our children's hesitancy to go to daily mass had to do with sin. And Scott made it clear to our teenagers, you never have to tell me why, but if you need to get to confession, because you are coming with us to mass, if you need to get to confession, you say the word and I will find a priest. That is real love. Now human development, rather than how to have sex, should be the focus of health education for adolescents. And that's something that we can do. Far too many schools go give information to children, intentionally breaking down their sense of modesty and shame. Typically, even in my high school, so we're talking 45 years plus, almost 50 years, they went over methods of contraception and abortion as a fail-safe. They need strategies for abstaining from sexual intercourse for the well-being of their own physical bodies, the well-being of future relationships, and we can provide something better. Now, there's some keys, and it starts young. We need to listen before we answer. Sometimes, as parents, we don't know what a child's really asking. For instance, Jimmy came into the kitchen and asked Mommy, where did Johnny come from? And the mom takes a deep breath, and she assumes this is the moment, and she's going to talk about where babies come from, and she explains it, and at the end he said, oh, I thought he came from Chicago. <laughs> oh, no. We don't know what they don't know. One of my good friends had a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a fairly young baby, and it just found out she was expecting. So she put the baby down for a nap. Her husband was home. And she went on a walk with her three-year-old and two-year-old. And as they walked, she wanted to share the good news. And she said, you know what I have in my, in my tummy? What? She said, I have a baby. And the, ba and the, and the two-year-old began to cry. I said, What's wrong? And she goes, you ate the baby. <laughs> And sometimes we give information on a need-to-know basis. My mother found herself in a dilemma. My mom is very, very modest. She was in her bedroom when my three-year-old brother, 16 years my junior, bounded into the room and said, Mom, what's in my pants? She thought, should I be the modern mother and use the term? Or should I do what I've always done and be quite indirect? She thought, no, it's, it's time to be the modern mother, and so she said the technical term, and he broke into a grin, and he said, no, it isn't. It's a penny. <laughs> and he pulled out a penny, at which point my mother wanted to get back that word. <laughs> to preserve a child's innocence, we give him information he needs when he needs it for his own body. To deepen our bond of love and respect with our child and to encourage his or her own natural sense of modesty, we honor our child with a private conversation about puberty and the act of marriage, dad to son, mom to daughter. And we state our openness to answer questions, but we don't need to fill in every blank at the very beginning. Preparation for adolescence is very important, and we want them to understand the difference between natural processes and actual sin. We prepare them for puberty so we can enter into it with them with joy, knowing that they are maturing instead of fearing changes over which they don't seem to have control. 
After I shared with Hannah the details about puberty, I told her that when she had her first cycle, I wanted to take her out for a very special celebration that she had become a woman. And I, I said, you know, we're not going to do this with grand fa you know, fanfare in the family, which of course she was most relieved <laughs> that I wasn't going to do that together. But when the day arrived, she just quietly told me, I said, do you need anything? She said, I'm all set. And I said, okay, I will let dad know that you and I will not be here this evening. And we went out and had a very special time acknowledging that she had become a woman. I wish there was a clearer demarcation for young men, become, uh, young boys becoming men. That's, that's harder to discern. But dads can still have that conversation with them about their bodies developing and, and what all that means and how beautiful it is because now they can become fathers and they'll have added responsibility. This is a great opportunity to make it clear Sperm only goes where it can be fruitful in your wife. Let me say it again. Sperm only goes where it can be fruitful in your wife. So that means all other expressions of release sexually are, are wrong. Even in marriage. Okay? Even in marriage. Without going into detail, describing aberrant sexual behavior, a father can clarify what moral behavior is and what it is not. And our child's sense of shame for shameful acts is a gift. It is God-given. And it's not an impulse to be squelched by a lot of information in a mixed-sex class. Each of us, mother and father, can acknowledge the beauty of God's gift to them able to become a mother, able to become a father, and what should precede that always, marriage, okay? And the responsibility, especially for the boys, to honor any woman who will not be his spouse, as well as the woman who someday may be his spouse. When our children turned 13, we had a special routine. Now, if your children haven't reached 13 yet, you might want to jot this down as an idea. We gave them a gold ring. It was a chastity ring. It was a purity ring, something that we wanted them to have be a symbol to them, whether or not uh, anyone else knew that. And then we took them on an overnight. Uh, to a hotel, and it was a fun time. We went to, yeah, I took Hannah, and then Scott got to go five times because we had five sons. Uh, they went to a hotel. We would go out for dinner. We would go to a movie. We would see movies in the hotel room. You might, might do bowling, might do skating, might do swimming. Lots and lots of fun. And then we lined up calls from our relatives, same-sex relatives, so aunts for Hannah and grandmother, and uncles and grandfather for the boys, and it was a call to chastity. Every member of the family uh, on my side uh, called and gave this charge to chastity, and we had a notebook for the kids to write down the comments, the scriptures, the thoughts. This is, this is part of what you can give that sense of generational uh, backup, you know, support, encouragement. There is a right way to do things, and you have choices and we want you to honor the Lord and honor our family with those choices. We want to remain approachable as questions emerge so that they perceive us as trustworthy guides. And if we don't tell them, their curiosity will be satisfied by someone else and we might lose that sense of trust that we will not withhold knowledge from them. You know, former abortion clinic manager Abby Johnson talked about her strategy before she became a Christian and before she uh, left the clinic. And their goal was to get into classes as young as possible, even as early as kindergarten. And the goal was to get the children to distrust their parents. That's the goal. She knew that if a child's natural inclination to modesty could be broken, and trust in their parents called into question early, by the time they were upper middle school students, they would be clients at her clinic. 
She knew junior and senior high students, and I'm almost quoting here, this was from her talk, rarely use contraception well, and she could bank on as many as three abortions a year per girl. Do not be naive. The evil one has many people who are hunting our young men and women to weaken their resolve, to knock them off balance, to misuse their passions, to lower their resolve with alcohol and drugs, and to leave broken bodies, broken relationships, and broken lives in the wake. But that is not God's plan, and you and I are an intimate part of what is God's plan for purity. I had a niece who was taking a class on human development in which they were to care for a doll round the clock for a few weeks. We had gathered together for a Christmas celebration. This was a particular assignment over the break. And uh, all of a sudden, the dolls started crying. They're, they use computer chips. So things are programmed into, the, into this doll. And of course, you know, it's one thing when it's a baby that you know, you're, you could pick up and cuddle and, and uh, you know, soothe. Um, it is so annoying to have this doll, like, rah, rah, you know. And I'm looking at her, and I'm like, Allison, can, can I, like, rock the doll for you or something? And she said, no, no, I've got a computer chip in my wrist, and I am the only one that can hold this baby. Um, and I really, at that point, could tell what they're trying to do is discourage the kids from having kids. They're not trying to teach them how you care for a baby. So the baby was set to cry every couple of hours. Uh, there's no father in the picture. There's no boy in the class that they're sharing responsibility. And all of a sudden, she said, you know, I've just got to shut this baby up. And so she, she goes, watch this trick. And she took a diaper and stuck the diaper in the mouth. And she said, you know, the same computer chip that's in the diaper is in the pacifier. And when I can't find the pacifier, I just stick a diaper in the mouth. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is not how you care for a baby. And she said, I'm just glad I did this because now I don't know if I ever want to have kids. And I said, I want to tell you something. This isn't anything like having a baby. If you had a fussy baby, your mom and I here would be walking the block with that little baby. We would cuddle that baby and hold him or her close, and, and you would nuzzle your baby and draw him or her close. You would have a husband who would do split shift with you if you had a really colicky baby, and this doll doesn't look at you, doesn't smile at you, doesn't coo at you. Believe me, this has nothing to do with being open to a baby. More than any curriculum, your marriage my marriage is the key for having our children understand that connection between love and life. And in the context of committed love, children are such a blessing. Now, we need to share the joy. There are some people who won't talk about sex being beautiful in marriage because they're afraid that their kids are going to think, well, then why do I have to wait? But the whole point is that there is joy in waiting. My dad never held back how beautiful his intimacy with my mom was. No details, no details. I wouldn't want to hear it, and he wouldn't want to share it. But he would say, our sex life has never been better. And I'd kind of look at him going, wow, dementia hit early. <laughs> no, I did it. I might have thought it, but I didn't say it. And, he, and I said, how? And he said, because I know her better. You see, this intimacy is about loving the person, giving yourself. It's not about what you get. It's what you give. God bless you. And so as we know each other better, we enter into that intimacy in a, a richer way. And, and scripture talks about, you know, Adam knew Eve and she conceived. So the idea of knowing is really intimately bound with the act of marriage. We need to teach them what Jose Maria Escriva said. It is easier to avoid temptations than to resist them. They've got to have a game plan before they're confronted with different situations, and they need to avoid and identify a near occasion of sin. 
As the saying goes, don't heat the oven when you can't cook the roast. We need to emphasize the advantages of chastity. You know, when they try to talk, have you ever watched those contraception commercials? You know, you have the lovely couple that's dancing or playing the piano together, singing, and then they say, side effects include heart attack, stroke, you know. <laughs> and they're hoping that you're not listening to any of these cataclysmic things that could occur. Guess what? Chastity doesn't have any of those side effects. The possibility of a solid marriage, that's one of the consequences. No bad memories, that's one of the consequences. No diseases, that's one of the consequences. You know, this whole monkeypox thing is unbelievable. And you know the CDC doesn't even have chastity as a recommendation? Oh, man, I can't get started on that. Now, friends are very significant and can be either supporters or detractors when it comes to this teaching. The right kind of friends can support your teenagers and strengthen their resolve. You know, 1 Corinthians 15.33 says bad company corrupts good morals. So we have to take that to heart. It matters who the friends are that you allow your children and grandchildren to surround themselves with. But St. Paul, speaking to St. Timothy, who was young, in 2 Timothy 2.22, that's easy to remember, 2 Tim 2.2, 2. It says, quote, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Catechism 2347 says, quote, the virtue of chastity blossoms in friendship and leads to spiritual communion, end quote. They will help each other grow in chastity. That's Catechism 2350. Friends in their peer group can help bond together to say, we're going to stand against this culture of death for a culture of life, which includes chastity. We have to remember that being the parent of the teen may not mean we are the very closest confidant of our child during those years. But parents keep parenting. Friendship will come, wonderful friendship. But you have not called to be your teenager's buddy. You have been called to be your teenager's mom or dad. Talk to your kids about pornography that it is seductive, that it is destructive, and that it is highly addictive. They are exposed younger and younger. And now we know from the videos, they're even teachers who are misusing classroom space and intimate friendship with your children and talking about things they should never discuss. There is a difference between lust and love, and lust will never be satisfied but we can purify lustful thoughts through prayer, through distraction. You can't keep thinking a lustful thought and think of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You just can't do it. So when you're in a bind, say a Hail Mary. Call on your guardian angel. Being alone in a secluded place on a date is a way to court disaster, not love. We have to be aware, and they have to be aware, that alcohol, even one drink, can lower inhibition. The time of day matters. You know, it's amazing the difference between before midnight and after midnight. And part of how we need to understand how our bodies are designed for the girls is that God has made them so that at a particular point in her cycle, she desires physical intimacy when she's ovulating. She may even have the thought, I don't even care if I get pregnant. You know, and then 15 minutes later say, oh my gosh, what did I do? She needs to be aware of that and sensitive to her body so that she can put added safeguards. That is not the best time to be going off in an isolated place with someone. God's designed our bodies so that arousal leads to the marital uh, embrace, like kindling to a fire. And that's good news. That's good news. We want the home fires to burn, right? But in the fireplace, in the fireplace, 
Fire offers what? Light, heat, warmth, romance. But if it escapes the fireplace, it causes damage and destruction and even death. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20, quote, shun immorality. Every other sin which a man commits outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have within you? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body, end quote. Do a, do a scripture study with your teen on this. Another translation, which I actually like better, is instead of shun fornication, sorry, immorality, it says flee fornication. Flee. What's the picture? It's like a house is burning and someone's saying, gee, I wonder if I could get a little close to the fire without getting burned. Maybe I could walk right, maybe I could even sneak in the house for a little bit and then run out the back door. No, if someone screamed flee, you are going to run in the opposite direction, okay? Run as if your life depended on it. The goal isn't to see how close to the fire you can get without getting burned. Now, some sins in dating relationships may only seem venial, but how often is the path to mortal sin beaten down, made more convenient through these venial sins? Proverbs 4, 14, and 15, quote, Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it, do not go on it, turn away from it, and pass on, end quote. Which woman will be a future mate isn't clear. But listen to this instruction from 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 6, quote, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from unchastity, that each one of you know how to take a wife for himself in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like heathen who do not know God, end quote. That would be a great passage to pray with your teen. What about during engagement? You know, the Song of Solomon cautions, don't stir up love until it please, until it can be satisfied. We have to understand some actions can result in defrauding, committing the sin of defrauding our beloved because we cannot satisfy it yet with the act of marriage. So we need to really put some boundaries. And when your child is engaged, say, how are you continuing to protect your chastity so that you are saving yourself for your wedding night? They need to be aware of their weaknesses, but also aware of the strength they can bring to the other. And they both have to be strong. Men cannot count on women saying no. Women cannot count on the man saying no. And if you don't actually desire to have sexual intercourse, break the engagement. Of course you desire each other. Of course you desire to give yourself to the other. But you form that boundary to preserve, to protect each other. And if the other person is unwilling to be strong, but is actually urging your child to go ahead, they need to rethink this relationship. We can't be naive. There was a young couple who had guarded their chastity and the night they got engaged, they went and had this very intense prayer time giving thanks to God for each other. And one thing led to another. The only time they had sexual intercourse and she got pregnant. Now, they still got married. They have a beautiful child. That child was conceived in love, but you know what? That was a tough way to start marriage. We've got to find our voice on cohabitation, men and women. Not even just to save money. It gives an appearance of evil at the very least. It increases the opportunity for temptation to become sin. And as St. Paul says in Ephesians 5.3, but fornication and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you as is fitting among saints. 
premarital sex cuts off grace needed for a healthy, good relationship. And you can't go to confession and be forgiven if you don't intend to stop. If you don't go to confession and you still receive the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin, you've compounded mortal sin. I had one person who told me, we just do our best to get them married. How is that the right foundation for marriage? They need to make a commitment to seek chastity from that moment on. One of them needs to move out, and then they need to go to confession and get things right with God to have the right foundation for their marriage. You don't get the grace of marriage before you're married. It's a sacramental grace. No wonder couples cohabit and then say, well, we tried it and it didn't work. They didn't try marriage. You can't try a sacrament. All they know is cohabiting doesn't work. But chastity before marriage strengthens us for chastity in marriage. The goal is self-control of our bodies and our passions instead of being controlled by our desires and passions. As one writer said, passionate love wasn't meant to travel from place to place, but to rest at home. God isn't against sex. It was his idea. Okay? We are to delight in our spouse. As Proverbs 5, 18 and 19 says, let your fountain be blessed. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely hind, a graceful doe. Let her affection fill you at all times with delight. Be infatuated with her love. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Now, what does that mean? It means pornography doesn't play a role in your marriage bed. I want to be clear about this. I was out in California and a woman came up to me and she said, my husband's asked me to watch some videos. And she said, I don't really like it, but he said it will help improve our sex life and I do want to work on our marriage. What should I do? And I said, this is quasi-adultery. You are being aroused by someone who is not your spouse and then using each other to get release. I said, this is not of God, and you need to destroy it. If you just put it away, someone might stumble onto it. All sexual acts, apart from sexual intercourse, where sperm can be fruitful in your wife, is immoral and serious sin. I want to tell you about this. After I raised my daughter, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, oh, I wish I could do a do-over with my kids. Well, you may have a chance with your grandchildren. <clears throat> After I raised my daughter, I read Curtis Martin's wife's book, Michael Ann Martin's wonderful book, Girls' Night Out, Having Fun with Your Daughter While Raising a Woman of God. And I am going to do something this summer with my two oldest granddaughters picking up on her idea with her daughter. I'm going to take this china cup with me when I go out to Kansas, and I'm going to have a little date out with my granddaughter, Veronica. I'm also going to bring a paper cup, and I'm going to put them on the table. I'm going to have a little prepared talk, and we're going to talk about what are the differences between the cups. Now, obviously, they both can hold something liquid. Uh, they could hold something delicious. Um, uh, they, they function, but how are they different? And I want to use it as an illustration about the beauty of her purity, that it's fragile, that it's valuable, that it's to be treated with care. A paper cup is cheap, it's throwawayable, easily damaged, destroyed, trampled on. I want her to know, I'm going to do the same thing with Naomi, who's 13. Each of us is a treasured vessel, according to the Lord. He is the one who made us, who redeemed us, who tells us every day 
how valuable we are. We want to respect the dignity of the other instead of treating each other like objects to be used. Now, I have seen this particular Lennox cup in TJ Maxx for years. And they were expensive, and I wasn't sure how I wanted to do this. So fast forward a couple weeks ago, I'm buying gifts down at a mall down south. And I, I walk in, and these are on super discount. Uh, $5 a cup, and it's Lennox. It's really nice, nice china. And so I did the math real quickly in my mind, and I gathered up, and I bought 16. And I think I'm going to have, I, I'm going to talk to Scott about it, but I really want Scott to do something similar with our young grandsons, but our youngest uh, grandson is, is not old enough to have this conversation with. And I think what we'll do is like a beer stein or a really cool coffee mug, um, but something very similar. So I think we can do men or women. And as I walked up to the counter, uh, I put him down on the counter, and the woman said, wow, you're really into China. And my first thought was, should I tell her why? No, I don't think I better tell her why. Absolutely, I'm going to tell her why. <laughs> and so I said, well, let me tell you, I read this book, and it inspired me. I really want to give my granddaughters a challenge to purity. And so I want them to have something really beautiful as an illustration, and then I want them to keep it. As a, as a keepsake of our time together and a reminder of how precious they are and how precious their purity is. And I just took a deep breath and I said, I already have 12 granddaughters, so I better get 16, you know, so that I have enough. And she, she and, and I looked at her and she went, up top. And she gave me this <laughs> big high five. And she said, there's some, there's some ladies in this department store that need to have that talk. I tried not to look around and make eye contact with anyone she was hearing. And she said, you know what? I'm going to do the same thing. When I end work today, I'm going to go buy some china cups. And I'm going to take out some of the girls in my neighborhood who I'm close to. And I'm going to give them a challenge of purity. Praise God. We need to pray for the strength, dear brothers and sisters. We have to pray for the strength to be part of the bulwark for our children and our grandchildren and our godchildren in a culture that is continuously beating against their values and their virtues. Scott says this world isn't a playground. It's a battleground. And we have enemies. We have enemies. We need to marshal the host of heaven who want to assist us. We need to ask our guardian angel to go with our guardian angel of our child who's going out on a date. I remember being out on a date once, and uh, this guy was like, I guess he thought he'd paid for a date and he was really looking forward to necking and, and he leaned in and I was like, um, you know, I'm really not sure I'm interested. And he said, mommy and daddy are thousands of miles away. And I said, but my Lord Jesus Christ is right over your shoulder. <laughs> Take me home. <laughs> we need to pray with our children and pray for our children. We do not need to live in fear about this, okay? We can be confident in coming before the throne of mercy, asking God for what we know he desires, which is holy marriages, holy families, godly offspring, right? St. Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 7, and 8, cast all your anxieties on him, for he cares about you. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We don't live in fear for chastity for us or for our children, but we pray and we're watchful, and every day we choose Christ to be the light of our lives. May he give us the grace to live our state in life well, and may he raise up many generations of faithful disciples.
God bless you. Thank you.